QSO Today, Episode 192, Violsa Bilagu, Z61VB. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, creators of the IC7610 and many other fine amateur radio transceivers, and by Soda Beams, providing the best amateur radio accessories for enjoying the great outdoors. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. I want to thank Marty Lane, OH2BH, who promised that at some point he will allow me to interview him for his referral today to my guest. I'm delighted to host Violsa Balagu Saka, Z61VB, from the Republic of Kosovo, formerly one of the ethnic states that made up Yugoslavia in the Balkan region north of Greece. Violsa has the distinction of being the very first YL licensee in Kosovo and is the chairperson or president of the Kosovo Amateur Radio Association, or SHRAC. Just to put this ham radio story into context, the Balkan republics were unified into one socialist country, Yugoslavia, by Josef Broz Tito from 1946 until his death in 1980. Tito was hailed as a world leader and the first communist to challenge Joseph Stalin. Tito's regime successfully kept the historical ethnic tensions calm that existed between the various groups that included Serbs, Albanians, Croats, and Macedonians. However, after his death, the vacuum was filled by the nationalists, causing Yugoslavia to break up into individual and independent nations. However, the area that was defined as Kosovo is between Serbia and Albania, and while 85% of the Kosovars were ethnic Albanians, Serbia still considered it Serbian territory. This ethnic strife between Serbia and Kosovo came to a head in 1988 when Serbian troops entered Kosovo to put down the rebels, resulting in a 10-year area of repression by Serbia against the ethnic Albanian majority. It was only in 1998 when NATO, ordered by President Bill Clinton, provided air support to the Kosovars against Serbia. It is in this context that my guest today began her ham radio story, survived the area of repression, mass murder, and the displacement of over one million Kosovo Albanians, that 25 years later is one of the leaders of the rebirth of ham radio in Kosovo. It is an important ham radio story to tell, and I'm grateful that Z61VB is my QSO today. Z61VB, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Violsa? Yes, uh, for Z1UG, this is Zulu61, Victor Bravo. Violsa, thanks so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Uh, yes, uh, Eric, uh, I'm very happy to be today with you. At, and as this is the first time that I'm referring to the larger audience of America, I would like to use the opportunity to, to send my best uh, and warm regards to all of the hams from America and uh, to the all American people there. You know, Americans are big friends of uh, Kosovar people. So I'm very happy to be here and to share with you my history. Uh, so I've started my uh, career uh, as an amateur radio in 1980. Uh, that was uh, in the time of former Yugoslavia. And at that time, I was, uh, I was attending a high school that was a kind of uh, a professional orientation center. Uh, I was attending uh, the Department for Radio and um, TV uh, Equipment so that I, I, because I wanted to study electrical engineering. So actually, uh, this, uh, my, this branch or department that I have chosen at the higher uh, education, I mean, at a high school, it was not really about ham radio. It has not, my class has nothing to do with uh, ham radio, but there was another class next to my class that they were doing some uh, practices in the ground floor of our school. And uh, while once I was coming back, uh, returning from my physical classes, I was listening to some strange uh, 
uh, noises and sounds like uh, it uh, it is the code sign uh, Morse code today ta 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 ta, ta. and it was uh, very strange for me and I stopped by and uh, opened the door and I've seen there a couple of uh, young boys uh, my colleagues actually from the next class doing some uh, strange at that time uh, things with a small uh, whatever was it at that time and somebody was uh, making some QSOs on a radio and for me it was so exciting and actually uh, I asked them what is this what are you doing and then they tried as there were no girls there <laughs> they were happy to have one there and everybody was so enthusiastic to explain me how they talk to the other people through the radio station. And uh, there are two means of communication through the microphone and the radio. And there is another uh, way of communication through the Morse code. And initially, as uh, I'm on, I mean, I was uh, really amazed. And actually, I thought, why not? Uh, uh, I can try one. Huh? Would you accept me for a few days just to try a bit uh, and talk to somebody? They said yes. And then actually from that day and on, this is how I started my career. So I initially I was uh, following them, how they were doing their QSOs through the radio. And then in order to, to be able myself to, to do these QSOs on SSB, mode i had they explained to me what i had have uh, to do actually i i needed to to attend the foundation let's say course uh, for the license and this is how i started so actually i started to attend these courses which were given there in that class and then uh, i attended um, i mean for I think it was a month uh, or two days in a week. So we went through the complete foundation program license, and then we had to, to undergo to take a test, which were organized by the previous amateur radio league. And uh, this is how then I passed the test. Actually, I had to exercise not only the communications part and uh, electronical parts uh, theory, but uh, I, we had to, to uh, practice Morse code as well in order to get our, uh, uh, let's say, foundation license. At that time, it was the level C. And actually, from that time, I started to all my free time and all my breaks between the classes I used to spend in the radio club there. Uh, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, when I tried to make the first QSO, I was so uh, excited that I could barely uh, pronounce any single letter, but somehow I survived and it became better and better. I remember as my coach or uh, mentor at that time, it was uh, our former president of uh, association, Amateur Radio Association. Unfortunately, he died two years ago. It was uh, Durmish Ali, Durmish Ali Smani, and his call sign was Zulu 61 Delta Delta. Actually, he was leading the course. He was giving the both theoretical part and uh, the practical part uh, for the course. And uh, actually, we were there together with some of my other friends with whom we have jointly re-established uh, just a few years ago the new, we have reactivated the, the association. At that time, uh, we were working under the former Yugoslav Republic and all our call signs actually were related to Yankee United stations. That was the general prefix for the all uh, eight uh, republics, actually six uh, former republics of Yugoslavia and two autonomous uh, 
provinces and uh, Kosovo. Kosovo was one of these provinces. And uh, our uh, pre first uh, call sign was uh, Yankee United 8 Alpha Lima Papa. So this was uh, uh, Yankee United 8 Alpha Lima Papa when we actually initially started uh, to work. And at that time, it was an extremely well organized amateur radio network and it was actually uh, managed by the amateur radio league of kosovo and there were many many radio clubs in kosovo at that time maybe more than 20 or 30 radio clubs in different cities of kosovo and then our main focus while we were working after we got our licenses. On what frequencies and modes did you operate? We mainly worked uh, on 3.5 megahertz. And uh, usually we made our QSOs on two different modes, on SSB and uh, CW. Myself as well, I was much more fond of uh, SSB. But we as well uh, participated in some of the CW contests as well. How prevalent were women in amateur radio in the Kosovo province? Yeah, very good question. Actually, I was not aware that it was, it, I was at that time, it means from 1980, there were very rare women there. And it, it uh, came up that uh, I was the only one. Huh? Can you imagine? Uh, to, to sustain. A uh, few of my girlfriends used to join me, but then they got bored from all this ta ti ti ta ta cw actually code morse for them. It was quite abstract. And uh, as they had to undergo this test, actually they gave up before uh, giving this test. But actually myself, and there was another lady, Yulia Urošević, she she is now living in Serbia somewhere. We were amongst the first uh, women who actually were very active in other different contests. As and actually later on, while we were studying uh, electrical engineering for five years in a row, we got the first prize uh, when we were contesting, competing with the whole former Yugoslav republics as students of electrical engineering. Were the hands of Kosovo, were they active with the other hands of the former Yugoslav Republic? Was, was there a national club uh, in Yugoslavia and were all of you active together? And did you know hams from the other regions? At that time, it was extremely well organized, big network, not just at national level but it was at republic and federal level. It was full of activities that were organized in three different disciplines, let's say in SSB mode, in CW and hawk, uh, fox hunting. And it was fox hunting, this is finding the, the radio stations that are hidden in the mountains, and this, that was a very attractive activity uh, for new hams. Actually, yes, at that time, we always made QSOs and lots of activities, lots of, uh, uh, we have very good memories from our contest within the Kosovo, but with not just Kosovo, but even with uh, Serbian uh, hams with, from Montenegro, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, Macedonia. So actually, we had all excellent fun uh, through both uh, radio stations and through other activities. That was an excellent professional entertainment that brought together all the youngsters from different republics of Kosovo, shared lots of views, lots of socializing, lots of professional exchange and uh, lots of fun in general uh, through the radio until 1988. And actually, everybody was using the prefix uh, Yankee United. Then each of the republic had their own numbers. So Kosovo had uh, Yankee United 8, Serbia 
uh, Yankee United one and uh, uh, the other republics until until after the war actually they started to change their uh, their prefixes as uh, as the situation political situation evolved. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? My high school uh, influenced my studies. I may say that uh, it influenced a lot because I already knew lots of professional things about tele- uh, telecommunication, about broadcasting, about uh, uh, frequencies, wavelengths, about signals, noises, other equipment. So when I started my studies at electrical engineering, we had there both uh, a small radio club where I was immediately involved, but also it was uh, we had to, to study very hard. Uh, electrical engineering was so hard that uh, it was not much time left for, let's say, constant activities on ham radio. But despite all these uh, uh, hard work, actually, myself and some of my friends, Hams, from the high school, we kept our activities uh, on at the, the faculty. So uh, when uh, we participated on an annual basis, we participated in some activities uh, that were organized by uh, uh, by the Federation for the Electrical Engineering Students, and among other among other contests in maths, in electronics, physics, and other subjects, and other sports as well, like uh, football, handball, chess, table tennis. There was a contest organized on uh, uh, CW activities, and this is where me. And uh, my friend, Yulia, we always competed and we always won the first prize. So we were very happy and uh, our faculty was always happy to send us every time there because we always got uh, the first prize. This is on CW. Can I ask you, uh, let's go back to 1988, because I think that uh, a lot of the listeners may not be aware of the history of the Balkans and what happened to Yugoslavia in 1988. If you'll speak to that a little bit in terms of what that history was like at that time and how it affected amateur radio in addition. Yeah, actually what I was uh, talking until now, it was a wonderful, uh, these were wonderful amateur radio times and we really were very happy then organizing lots of uh, other international championships activities. But uh, this was until 1988. So in 1988, actually, the, the new regime from Serbian regime has completely changed uh, their attitude towards Kosovo. I can speak uh, on behalf of Kosovo. And actually, they suspended our autonomy. And actually, with this, actually, they suspended all the activities on the ham radio. At that time, I was already, I had graduated. I was an engineer because I graduated at 1987. And having behind some maybe five uh, first prizes uh, during my studies uh, on uh, CW as a ham, but then everything stopped, and we were actually, the situation was awful, and we were left without jobs. Uh, I mean, everybody was expelled from the main institutions. And uh, so we amateur radios, not that we couldn't uh, continue with our activities, but we had to hide as well. Those who had uh, radio stations were uh, searched by the police, and myself as well, uh, although I didn't have my radio at home, but I had lots of excellent radio amateur literature that I had to get rid of that because uh, we were somehow uh, looked uh, by the police. And actually, in order to do so, I mean, we had to get uh, rid of everything that uh, used to deal with amateur radio. So until 2012, actually, everything had stopped. So our amateur radio clubs were destroyed. 
our main uh, uh, amateur radio league administration. It was uh, completely uh, destroyed and it was not functional anymore. Did this happen in the other Yugoslav republics as well? No, no. It happened just uh, uh, in Kosovo because uh, Kosovo has declared uh, uh, they actually uh, suspended our autonomy, whereas the other republics, they were on their own doing their activities. Uh, so uh, in Mac Macedonia, Montenegro actually they didn't suffer because they already had uh, the mandate of a republic. So this is something that didn't attack them as, as it did with us. And now this message from ICOM. ICOM is now a key sponsor to the QSO Today podcast. My thanks to the team at ICOM America for making this possible. I'm excited to speak about the ICOM IC7610 and have viewed a number of unboxing videos on YouTube. This rig has full dual RF direct sampling receivers, in other words, two independent SDR or software-defined radio receivers with Digicel preselectors in the front, where you can listen to each of these separate receivers on the left and right channels of your headphone or stereo speakers, allowing you to be in two places at the same time. This combination of direct sampling and 110 dB RMDR allows you to pull those weak signals out of the noise, even with strong adjacent signals and neighborhood electronic noise. The IC7610 has a beautiful 7-inch color TFT Touch LCD screen on the front panel for easy control of the radio, with plenty of knobs and buttons for the ham radio operator, as well as a rear connector to connect your large color monitor. ICOM has a tradition of making beautiful functional radios and has done an amazing job with this rig to make your DX and contesting experience even more enjoyable. Even if you're not a DXer or contester, but want an amazing HF user experience, the IC7610 will provide years of fun and on-air enjoyment. There is a great review in the DX Engineering blog with the perspectives of experts like Rob Sherwood, NC0B, of Sherwood Engineering, who praised the features of the IC7610 as well as its actual performance. I will put these links in the show notes pages. Be sure to visit ICOM America at www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to see the complete line of ICOM equipment. And when you make your next ICOM purchase, tell them that you heard it here on QSO Today. And now back to my QSO Today. So the former Yugoslav federal state was broken into a, a bunch of smaller countries. So Slovenia is an independent country, Macedonia is an independent country, but Kosovo did not become an independent country. It was still part of Serbia, right? Yes. It was actually, it was uh, an autonomy province, uh, but not, uh, it was a constituent, const, uh, how would I say, constitution part of uh, Yugoslavia, but still under the Serbia. It has all the rights uh, like the other, as the other republics, but still it was, uh, it has a kind of a linkage with uh, Serbia. So that was a slight difference between Kosovo as an autonomous province compared to the other republics. So for the other republics, it was much easier to separate from the former uh, Yugoslavia, whereas Kosovo, it was quite difficult. And once we had pronounced uh, the, let's say, autonomy, it was again suspended in uh, 1989 uh, by Milosevic regime. And actually, this is where everything then started to go downstream for us. So in other words, this was a civil war between... In between the Serbs and the Kosovo? Actually, there was no war, actually, between two parties. It was always the strong uh, war just between the Serbian army and the civilians. There was no fight because we had just to protect ourselves. It was such, such a big aggression from the Serbian army. So they expelled us from the works, from all other administrative systems, because then also Kosovar people didn't want to accept now uh, the new regime that will actually suspend all our rights 
And actually, we started to build some parallel education systems. People, schools were somehow closed. There was a kind of apartheid. You had a separate classes in schools for Serbian uh, pupils and students and for Albanians one, once. And this started for 10 years. So we were left without job, without proper education, without completely isolated from the rest of the world. So the, the radio station was the only, apart from the landline telephone, radio station was the only communications mean with the other world. So in other words, even under the former Yugoslav Republic, you had a limited number of frequency bands that you could actually were licensed to use. Is that correct? And, uh, now I cannot remember because at that time, uh, I mean, uh, the the equipment was uh, really, I, I'm not well, uh, I cannot now recall what was the regulation of the amateur radio. I'm sure that there were bands, but for us with our license, let's say at that time we couldn't uh, work uh, other other bands as well. How did the hams and you, how did you survive that 10 years? <laughs> well, it was extremely difficult, not just in terms of uh, real pure uh, existence, because, uh, well, myself, I was considering that once I become an engineer, I will have a bright career, future, no financial problems. And then it didn't turn to be like that because... Uh, uh, I got married on 1989. My husband was working for the television. He was a chief engineer there. And I was actually then employed. So I started my job with a, uh, as a uh, frequency planning engineer in the other department of uh, uh, transmissions of uh, television of Pristina. And then I couldn't work longer than two years because then everybody was... Uh, expelled from the job when uh, they they brought these new regulations nobody wanted to work under these administrative rules when they suspended the autonomy then as well uh, they didn't uh, actually let you in, to get involved in other other levels uh, of uh, administrations or work so that's why my husband and most of people uh, remained without jobs. Schools were closed for Albanian people. And actually then it was kind of difficult, uh, extremely difficult situation because uh, we had no job. Uh, we had to, to do something just to survive. And then I started to work uh, <laughs> something to sell some wedding dresses and uh, to try some other things. I started to learn English by the way, at that time. Uh, it was uh, very rare for people to speak English at that time. So that was one of the reasons why we didn't uh, think about DXs because uh, our English was quite limited. And actually, to do any kind of uh, DX, you had to know some basic English language, which at that time was not often. And then during this gap, big gap, uh, I learned English. I started my studies on private houses because all the education system now started to build on uh, private uh, houses. That was a kind of uh, mobilization for the parallel education system for Albanians here in Kosovo because then there was a struggle between Serbs and Albanian because everything was suspended. So you, we didn't actually, you, nobody wanted to send a child to, to learn Serbian history and in Serbian language and that's around. So that was a kind of revenge for us to try to fight and still maintain our national identity. So you created home schools. Yes, and we went to homes there and actually just try to maintain a level. And that was same for uh, universities, that was same for primary schools and secondary. You can imagine how difficult that was 
but actually this is the way how we survived. We had to survive. And then we were working whatever we could, huh? whatever we could. Those who were lucky to leave the country, they went in uh, West. But uh, we tried as well, uh, myself, my family, and the others who thought that, listen, uh, we are, uh, well, we haven't done anything wrong. We are intellectuals. We are uh, saying like the other people, now we are back to zero. And we, we don't want to, to leave our countries. We want to be here. This is why uh, we studied for, to build our country, to become professionals and contribute to our countries. So if everybody leaves, then it is the easiest way. And then we fought, we fought, I actually survived. I had then two daughters, beautiful ones who are now growing up, and my wonderful husband who has supported me. Actually, we supported each other in the best way we could, but actually somehow we managed then to survive. And it's not just us. Uh, many people like us have uh, survived, uh, not just physically, but even emotionally, intellectually, but uh, with uh, lots of consequences. Huh? This lasted like that until 1999 of the Serbians. So actually, there was no civil work here, a uh, war here. It was just the attacks from the Serbians pretending then to become as victims. They had a very strong lobby. I can admit that, uh, yes, uh, they are very smart, intelligent. The whole academia was working to support uh, this, their strategy and uh, trying to expel uh, one million people from Kosovo. What happened in 99 that, that turned it around? There were a small group formed like uh, KLA, and then they started to protect themselves, to organize themselves, and uh, raising their voice of, uh, uh, against the uh, Serbian regime. And then on the other side, citizens were organized in demonstrations as well, but it didn't uh, help a lot. Actually, there were two kind of streams here. One was peaceful one. We were demonstrating on the streets, and but it was going very slowly. And then there was another group, more radical one, who wanted to make things happen in a more radical way. Actually, Serbia inherited the whole Yugoslav army. Not just Serbian, but the whole Yugoslav army. What could we do, poor citizens with bare hands, with uh, very low incomes, hardly surviving, to fight against all these uh, strong troops uh, they were sp sending in order to deal with all these, uh, these protests. So they were spe uh, sending special units, uh, police units, uh, well-trained polices, uh, beating people, maybe killing them, sending them to jails. And this was uh, like a nightmare for 10 or maybe more years. It was a uh, few years. Actually, it, it is more than 20 years because once uh, you are isolated from everything, uh, it is one kind of repression, economical, emotional, psychological, etc. Human rights. Completely, you were out of jobs and out of a decent life. On the other hand, when we were trying to demonstrate and raise our voice, there was strong aggression against the civil population then. And actually, it, was, it lasted for years uh, until the former president of America, Bill Clinton, with the other NATO forces, who actually started to become really aware of what's happening here. Lots of massacres, lots of civil killings, and that's right. But the world uh, started to react late because uh, Serbian media and uh, was uh, so strong, their lobby abroad was so strong, and I somehow 
congratulated them on how long could they introduce themselves as victims while they were massively killing, torturing, raping women, and actually it was a disaster. And in 1999, that was uh, today and yesterday, it was the 19th year of uh, a NATO bombing of Kosovo. Initially, Serbian groups, they were killing uh, people in rural parts, in villages where they could, they were far from media, far from other people. But luckily, there always there was there was always somebody to survive all these terrorisms, and uh, make some shootings and videos, and they were sent to the large audience and large uh, these strong Western countries, and then finally uh, it came up into the surface. What is Serbia doing to to civilians in Kosovo? So Kosovars were always protecting. They had actually to organize themselves and ran into the mountains, organize themselves in a sort of uh, uh, protection groups. But what could they do in front of such a big army and train people and uh, big hate? Actually, they were people. We were all surprised what a big hate was from them. Huh? Because once you hate somebody so much, you, you otherwise you could not do such a terrible, terrible massacres, which are being shown in, uh, in the world uh, often now. And in 1999, on the 24th of May, March, NATO decided to bomb Serbia, and uh, I mean their troops here. And between the March and uh, June 1999, that was this famous exodus when uh, the military uh, soldiers and police of uh, Serbians were expelling people from their homes. Uh, and they wanted to clean Kosovo. In, in the evening, NATO was bombing. During the days, they were doing millions of lots of massacres. They were killing people. They were raping women, men as well. They were expelling them from their homes. And myself and my two daughters, my daughters were eight and nine years old when we had to leave our apartments. We uh, who were considered to be the highest intellectuals in Kosovo, myself and my husband, my family, my friends, everybody had to be equal. And we went in a row like Jewish used to do during the Second World War, and we were expelled from our homes. It was like in the, the Eric Maria novel, when you see what have former how was this Holocaust done? Huh? We were put in a row and sent to the trains. Through the trains, we were expelled from Kosovo. They were uh, military forces were uh, taking everything from, uh, from us, our IDs, our jewelries, our monies. They were killing people. It was a disaster. And I and lots of uh, my family, my daughters, and lots of other people were witnessing this. We were sent to uh, the border of Macedonia in the field outside. It was uh, just with a bag and in the open air. We were sitting there. It was raining. We were left in the mud after the train trying to, to pass the border and go to Macedonia. And then we, we became refugees. This is how we became refugees. We hardly, somebody uh, went to Macedonia, somebody went to the camps, were sent to the camps in Albania. And then there were organized flights for refugees from these camps, camps to USA, to, to other Western countries and stayed there for three or four months until June 2019, when actually, finally, NATO beat it, the Serbian troops. So we were refugees in Macedonia, my family, in Gostivar, and we stayed there for three months. 
staying in a in a queue waiting for food, for drinks and everything for three months. But finally, uh, they expelled Serbian troops from Kosovo. And uh, the Serbs uh, went back after they destroyed everything. Actually, it was not during this, those three months that they destroyed. They were step by step destroying all the economy, all the education, all the health system, amateur radio as well, everything that existed. We were part of a high civilization, but always kept uh, isolated, not to see what's happening in the other world. And this is how we lived. After the bombing, we came back immediately, my family, my husband. We were considered, uh, really, we were patriots because we were still young. We could go fly somewhere abroad and uh, try to have a, to build from the scratch our lives. But actually, we never wanted to leave our countries. And it, it, we were thinking if us intellectuals, if we leave our Kosovo, then uh, what can we say, I mean, to our uh, new generations? So we came back. We had to start from the scratch, from 1999. Everything was stolen. Everything was ruined, destroyed. And again, we had to start from the scratch. For the amateur radio, I could never even think about it. Since 1989 until 2012, it's more than 25 years, I thought that it was a long history, good, nice timing, but that was our past and nobody was thinking. I haven't even seen my colleagues, my pranks, that we were having such a good time during our ham competitions, radio activities, like, for example, uh, those that we are now together. I mean, uh, after 1999, we came back and we started to rebuild our lives. And luckily, the international community started to work here. And myself, as I already started uh, talking some English, I was very lucky because I, were, I was hired by the international organizations to work for them. And then since then, until now, I've been working for the international organizations like European Union Agency, German Government Institution, UNDP, uh, UNICEF as a consultant uh, myself. In the meantime, I managed to graduate my studies in English, having both children and working hard. Uh, I wanted to finalize my studies in English uh, because English is becoming a um, kind of a official language and you always have a better job. Uh, it's always much easier when you interpret your own ideas in English rather than uh, let somebody else trying to interpret your emotions or, and uh, facts. And you always get uh, information lost uh, during the translation. So somehow I'm happy that I managed to study English. Can you believe I studied English language here at the university without being able to travel to England uh, because it was uh, costly. We couldn't travel from Pristina to the clo closest uh, city to Peya or I couldn't iman imagine traveling somewhere abroad because of the regime. And today... I mean, luckily, our life have changed quite uh, a lot. And now, this message from Soda Beams. In episode 188, with Richard Newstead, G3CWI, owner of Soda Beams, we discussed the uses of the Whisper Light test system that leverages the WhisperNet network to verify the performance of your antennas and antenna systems. The WhisperNet network allows you to see where your signal is received around the world that includes a signal strength report. When used with the whisper light, this analysis can be radically refined to give you true performance results. The whisper light is not expensive and will give you a whole new fun and intensive look at antenna building, orientation on your QTH, and which corners of the world your signal is heard. 
Think of Soda Beans the next time you want to take your ham radio to the Soda Mountaintop or across the street to the park. With hundreds of items, all meticulously selected and built, you won't go wrong. Keep in mind that Soda Beams offers a 10% discount at checkout on all items purchased from Soda Beams if you use QSO Today, one word, QSO Today at checkout. Soda Beams, amateur radio for the great outdoors. And now back to our QSO Today. After 25 years of no ham radio, of no amateur radio in Kosovo, how did it rekindle in 2012? What was the impetus to get it going again? As I said, uh, I was working for the international organizations. I started my new life. Everything was going fine. Wanted to catch up. We had better salaries and we have completely forgotten about amateur radios. But there were people, uh, foreign people. I mean, we were there under the administration, UNMIC, UN administration, before we got our independence in 2008. And ANMIC had their own telecommunications authority department there. And there were few amateur radios who wanted their licenses to get renewed. And th there is a kind of history there. They started to give some uh, uh, call signs uh, within U YU, former, let's say, call sign. And uh, it was a kind of a mess then. But still, myself and some of my colleagues, ham colleagues, were not involved in this procedure. Later on, just then, uh, in a little bit earlier than 2012, it was Marty Lane, Oscar Hotel 2, Bravo, uh, Bravo Hotel, who came under the Goodwill mission to see the environment and to restart the activities of ham radios here in Kosovo. And actually, Marty was working hard uh, with the, the telecommunication authorities and department that was under the UN mission at that time, uh, somehow to restart uh, with the uh, amateur radio activities, regulations. But then uh, in 2008, uh, after the uh, we uh, we proclaimed our uh, independence. Actually, Marty was again very active. He was working hard with our authority uh, for the, the telecommunications. Uh, they worked hard uh, with the other officers that were uh, engaged at the, this uh, telecommunication authority and in, somehow managed that in 2012-12, they prepare the regulation for the amateur radio uh, activities. Was there a national amateur radio organization at that point? Initially, there was, as we were an independent country, we started to rebuild our institutions, the legal framework, and institutions in general. So one uh, of the legislations that was actually adopted, it was the law on uh, telecommunication services in Kosovo. And within this law, then they managed to prepare together with the staff of the reg regulatory authority for post and telecommunications services, and they managed to prepare the regulation on amateur radio services. And then uh, we were contacted, uh, we, the, the elder, or let's say the veterans of amateur radio, were contacted by some of the people that somebody knew each other. We were re-identified by these people. We were invited to this ceremony when they were celebrating the, the amendment and the adoption of the new regulation of Amateur Radio Society. And this is when I, after 25 years, started to hear something new about Amateur Radio. And then uh, for the first time, I was seeing my friends that we were starting together our Amateur Radios at this ceremony when we were pronounced as uh, the new hams uh, under the Zulu 6 call sign. 
And now this special break from QSO Today and QRP Labs. After listening to the audio of this podcast and understanding the importance to ham radio to a developing nation, I called Hans Summers, G0UPL at QRP Labs. I'm going to donate three QRP Labs QCX transceiver kits to Violsa's University of Pristina engineering class when they are studying for their amateur radio licenses. Hans has agreed to match or donate an equal number of transceiver kits for every one QCX transceiver that you and I purchase and designate for the University of Pristina in Kosovo. So far, we are sending six QCX transceiver kits between us. Help us increase this number so that every engineering student can have his own QRP Labs QCX transceiver when he gets his license. So if you'd like to help Hans and I aid in the rebirthing of ham radio in Kosovo, then please click on the link on the show notes pages to QRP Labs and tell Hans that your QCX order is for Kosovo. QRP Labs is my favorite ham radio kit company. It should be yours too. And now back to QSO Today with Violsa Z61VB. You didn't get just involved. You became its the club's national president going forward. How did that happen? I was announced as a president a bit later. Huh? Well, we got involved under the new regulation. Actually, we were entitled to get uh, a re-license, new licenses again under the new legal framework. So we were five to six uh, people that were from the former system. As I got uh, uh, in the former system the highest degree of my license, it was uh, fully compliant to the new regulation requirements. And then we were re-licensed as per the new regulation. And that corresponded to the HEREC uh, license. So that is how I got my Zulu 6 uh, 1 Victor Bravo license. After that, actually, the society itself, it was not yet established. So we were identified as individual hams from the previous, let's say, uh, uh, group, but not yet, we were not yet reestablished as a new society because there was a new system in place, there were new legislation in place, and we had to undergo through some assembly, mm -hmm. election mm -hmm. procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is how uh, we actually started to think about this. And that night when we were awarded new licenses, there was a dinner organized by the Authority of Telecommunications. And this is how I met uh, Mr. Marty Lane and Hans Blundin Zimmerman, who at that time was the president of IARU Region 1, and Marty Lane was the coordinator of the Goodwill mission. And actually, he was assigned to reactivate amateur radio activities in Kosovo. And at that night, uh, actually, I was sitting close to Hans with the other new Hans. And we were then talking about how can we reestablish now the new society. And then I said, uh, well, listen, I thought that uh, I'm done with the uh, amateur radio society but on the other hand, if uh, it will not be us from the former group, we were just few, uh, five to seven people maybe, hardly identified, then we can hardly expect that new people come now after 25 years and try to build something from the scratch. And then we were invited. Well, I showed my interest that together with uh, my other ham friends, that we are interested to start new, uh, let's say, society. But under the, those uh, circumstances, it was extremely difficult to start from the scratch. Huh? There was nothing, not even a sign from the previous system here. New institutions, they never heard about uh, radio activities, let's say other institutions or society or whatever. And as it is a new country, everybody was trying to, to think uh, how to make their best things. And in the meantime, electronics, uh, uh, Skype, uh, Facebook, the technology has evolved so much. So it was really difficult to think about initiating something that was considered completely dead for 25 years. 
years. But then step by step, we consider this as our main duty and desire to start something and actually to boost a bit uh, our willingness. We were invited to Friedi Schaffen, even myself and uh, Feti Fazliu, another ham, uh, Zulu 601 Fox Fox. And actually, we were invited as guests at that time. We were not yet members of IRU, just to see how does amateur radio wor world look like, because we thought that it doesn't exist anymore, I mean, in the real terms. And then it was for us very difficult to get there, although Marty and the Goodwill a project were keen to help us. Uh, we have strong visa restrictions for traveling abroad, and it was a nightmare until we got our visas to go to Friedrichshafen. But anyway, with the goodwill of uh, all organizers of the Friedrichshafen and other hams, we managed to go there. It was an extremely good, exciting experience. And there were international hams who supported us there. And we were really amazed with the Friedrichshafen event there, ham radio event. And then we had a few meetings with different structures of IRU from, and other, uh, let's say, ham structures there. And we discussed how could we actually initiate uh, here the activities. Actually, starting the activities here, it was uh, very difficult because uh, it was a really very hard work needed to be do done. And uh, then I said, uh, we were talking to Hans, to Marty, to some others, how could we do this uh, in the most easier way? As I was always uh, engaged with uh, international organizations, but at the same time, as an engineer and some background in English language, I was invited by the dean of the faculty to teach uh, students of electrical engineering, engineering technical English. And then I was thinking here that the best opportunity for us would be if I start my lectures, if I start with a group of students from the telecommunications department teaching the foundation license for them in English language. So at the same time, I adapted my curricula in English for electrical engineering students to the foundation license literature. And then we learned lots of things, both for telecommunications, English language. And at the same time, we got prepared for the foundation license. So we, we say in English that you were killing two birds with one stone. Maybe more. But I was not alone, luckily, here. The idea was mine to use this opportunity. Otherwise, it would be too difficult now to call, invite people. So here we were working in three different fronts. First, we wanted to have some young people interested and somehow bound <laughs> to bind them in this uh, scholar system because then they might not be interested. And I had my other colleague, Ham. He's a very active Ham in the radio. He's participating right now in uh, some comp worldwide SSB competition. This is Femi, Zulu 62, uh, Fox Bravo. And actually, I was doing the theoretical part for the foundation, explaining according to our regulations, because we have a strict regulation which defines what should cover the foundation licenses, what is the theoretical part that uh, 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 the trainees need to learn about. Mm -hmm. Then there was mm -hmm. the, the legislation part for the regulation radio activities in Kosovo, and then the communications part on SSB, let's say, or CW. So actually, we were sharing all these three fields, teaching them, and it was quite difficult time uh, to teach them because theoretical part, it was not difficult because I had my classrooms, but the practical part, 
as we still didn't have the room for Radio Club because it was occupied by the car. Nobody thought that there will be another radio, radio club. We had uh, Femi, my uh, co, let's say, uh, assistant, co-trainer, let's say. Uh, he took a portable radio to make to simulate exercises and portable antenna to teach QSOs how to do QSOs of the students. And you have that is why I've sent you lots of pictures to have a bit of feeling how did it look like. So this is the way how we uh, were training our our students. And in, in order to create time, more hands. Yes. Right. I mean, because and this is how just to reemphasize here, um, you're starting in 2012 with a base of six hams in yes. Kosovo, and mm -hmm. so therefore visited... you're 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 creating new hams from this from this yes. course. Yes. Yes. After we came back from Friedrichshafen, and uh, it was Hans that encouraged us if we could let's say produce five or seven hams. He said that. Okay, we will come and watch your watch your tests and license. Mm -hmm. I said five. Let's. I think that we can do quite much more than just five additional new fans. And this is how I applied this, as you say. With uh, <laughs> I hit it to you. You, you two killed birds. two birds with one stone. Can we go back to Friedrich Schaffen for just a minute? And I, I don't want to, and I don't want the listeners to think this at all. That I want to diminish the Kosovo War in any way, and what happened to you over that twenty-five year period of time. But when you went to Friedrich Schaffen, it, it seems to me that you were after twenty-five years. You're almost like Rip Van Winkle king up to amateur radio. What was your response to what you saw at Friedrich Schaffen in terms of how amateur radio had evolved? Can you imagine we who thought that amateur radio is dead, nobody's using it anymore? We went there and saw a giant event. All the workshops, all, all the events, the fairs, all the people there for us. It was the first time that we are meeting international hams. For us, it was a dream. We were only meeting 25 years ago. Uh, our, let's say, friends from neighborhood, but we never had chances to meet people from abroad. And when we realized that amateur radio has progressed, has advanced so much, we were really amazed. And actually, uh, immediately when we came back, we had to work in two fronts. Uh, one, in trying to encourage new hams trying to train them. We had absolutely nothing. We had just the big desire, the knowledge, and only few uh, Femi, Zulu 6-2, Fox Bravo, he came with his own equipment. Myself, I didn't have anything. But he, as he was on missions uh, abroad, he could manage to get some portable radios, and he had already his own shack. But we were not in touch. Can, can you believe? We were living in the same city without meeting each other ever for 25 years. At the same time, coming back to your questions, how did I become president? We had to organize the new assembly because we had to, to follow the, the rules and... Uh, Actually, although we were not members of IRU, anyway, we wanted to start building uh, according to the IR, uh, IRU requirements and to the international standards as we had our regulations. And actually, Hans and Marty as well said that you will have to reestablish your assembly. You have to have your board elected in a democratic way. You have to have your people of the board uh, selected in a democratic way. And then this is how you should start working there. So we worked in parallel. So we had actually started to find former HEMS uh, to, to register people in the new society 
actually we organized the new assembly. You have as well some pictures from 2012 or 13 when we did this. And you have the pictures of the new having people from different institutions, having hams, having students who in the meantime got their passed their exams and licensed by the authority under the supervision of IRU people. And this is how actually initially I was uh, uh, I was proposed, I never actually liked to be a part of uh, management. 25 years ago, I wanted to compete. I was younger. I was not interested. Uh, what are the regulations and what are all these events? I just wanted to be a contester. After 25 years, let's say, or more, I realized that uh, it is not my duty now uh, to be a contester, but I ha we need to establish the system to build new strategy, new policy, to create a good environment to build a new amateur radio society from the scratch. And my role here was seen more like this rather than a contester. But anyway, in the assembly, in the first assembly, uh, I, was, I was recommended to be a vice president of the amateur radio society, Shrak. And uh, actually, the former president of uh, the Amateur Radio League was an 80 years old uh, person who is still alive, but, but very sick, Sabit Zumberi, whose uh, sign is Zulu 61 Alpha Alpha. He was actually a ham from the 1946. He was active since that time and always competing in uh, all the disciplines. He was as well the head of the, the former Yugoslav Amateur Radio League. And actually, he had, he had great sympathies for me, being uh, the first uh, woman and uh, among the only women. And he said that you are an engineer, you have to be, I will uh, recommend you to be the vice president, while the president was uh, 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 recommended uh, the guy that recently died, Alia. And this is how everybody accepted us, the new border, board appointed, and I was actually working as a vice president until a few years. But when uh, Ali got sick, Actually, even as a vice president, I had to take an, lots of initiatives because Ali was very sick. He could not manage to deal with all the trainings, setting up the radio club, trying to communicate with IRU. I was initiating, uh, actually, I was starting to prepare together with the member board, board members our papers for application to the IRU, Region 1 Society, for our acceptance. We were working extremely hard in trying to get new hands on, trying to find new room for our radio club and society, try, because we, amateur radio is an expensive hobby. Uh, our institutions uh, never considered as priority to, to fund. Actually, they had sympathies for the amateur radius, but when it uh, came to sponsoring, there was not uh, much sponsoring at that time. So we had uh, some uh, support from Goodwill um, project, whereby uh, some don donations were given. We have rehabilitated one of the rooms at the faculty. I had to work hard in convincing uh, the administration and the dean of the faculty to give us a special room where we can start transmitting together with uh, students before installing our shack there at the radio club. We were working in the whole of the faculties, uh, trying to get uh, connected to the internet, trying to simulate hemisphere 
uh, radio QSOs until we got some radio stations at the club and started uh, to, to transmit on the air. So I was involved together with uh, my colleagues who supported me in training New Hams, trying to activate uh, our shack. Um, uh, then we became five or seven veterans together with the youngsters and together with some of the support from the Goodwill and donors who gave us uh, radio stations, some antennas, we started to, to transmit in the air. At the same time, we were uh, participating. Actually, we were building our relations with the authority, uh, telecommunications authority, and jointly we organized uh, actually the testing. The tests were organized uh, of the new hams uh, in uh, the premises of the university. It was supervised by uh, representatives of IRU. It was Hans, it was Marty. There were other, other officials from uh, uh, telecommunications authorities. And before actually distributing the tests, we were going together once again through every single question of the exam. And when we were actually compiling the exam, there was a commission uh, that worked on uh, uh, tests. Uh, actually, we were consulting ARRLs, L guidelines for the for the, the test examinations. And actually, we were doing lots of exercises with students based on the ARRL guidelines for the HEM licenses. And together with uh, some of the literature we got uh, from, uh, uh, from other Western European countries here. And uh, as well, we adopted them according to our regulations. What is the public perception of ham radio in Kosovo now? Uh, is that a, is that a challenge that that your amateur radio association has in terms of reaching the public? Well, actually, uh, public is not yet uh, very much uh, acquainted uh, with the current uh, activities. Actually, they 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 are watching what we are doing. They are all. Uh, um, I mean, they appreciate our activities, but uh, most of them are saying, oh, well, uh, is, is it still happening? Radio, amateur radio, isn't this a dead activity? Everybody is surprised that uh, we are coming on and somehow we are restarting something that they were considered it was almost dead. But we see that there is a good appreciation but on the other side, on the other hand, as I was uh, seeing in uh, the two former last conferences that I was attending, the IRU Region One conferences, I see that um, I mean things have changed in the meantime. Youngsters here in Kosovo, they have all the <laughs> mobile phones, uh, internet. Uh, uh, Skype, uh, Snapchats, and everything. So they consider like it's uh, sometime, somehow they are hesitant that it might increase the interest of uh, of youngsters a lot. Huh? But uh, somebody, some others that try to do uh, ham activities, then they get into into it. Huh? But somehow there is still a struggle between the new generation, IT rev revolution, and the former one. Huh? So really, this is something that I think is happening in the whole globe without excluding Kosovo, somehow. You described an Elmer. His call sign was Z61DD. What was his name? It was uh, Ali Smane. Ali Smane, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, he died some two years ago, and he was appointed as initially a president of SHRAC in 2013 when we made this new assembly. And uh, actually, I was uh, elected uh, vice president, but uh, very soon. Uh... 
you, you you succeeded him when he died you became the president well even in the activities i was immediately involved in mm-hmm. many things i was proactive because um, of my professional background as engineer as a uh, herrick uh, amateur radio and uh, because of my strong professional experience with uh, internationals in writing communication and coordination of uh, activities with uh, higher level institutions and uh, with internationals in English language. There was a lot of uh, um, documents to produce in English, to coordinate and communicate. And this is somehow how I have been uh, delegated the whole uh, activities uh, can I ask you also, the name of one of the original hams who uh, in Yugoslavia, S61AA, what was his name? Yeah, it was um, uh, Sabit Zumberi. He was one, the, he's still alive, by the way, he's 80, 83 years old. He started his uh, experience uh, in ham radio since uh, 1946, I think. So he was leading the amateur radio league here in in a former Kosovo during the the Yugoslav regime and he was the director of uh, the amateur radio league and it was at that time this was uh, under Tito yes it was uh, quite some time during the Tito and even after he died sometimes because Tito died in uh, 1984 if but I think that Yugoslavia became, didn't under Tito, it became a Soviet satellite in the sphere of Soviet influence, you know, during the, during the time. Uh, a sort of, yeah, during, during the 40 years of um, uh, Tito time, it was a socialism, not exactly a kind of uh, communism. It was an extremely good life, social life. It was a peaceful, peaceful, let's say, world so that people had uh, w- were working together there was no hate uh, there was a good living society and relations between all the nations we were as well part of this good relations between let's say uh, serbian population croatian bosniaks and all other uh, other nations that were living well, that's what I remember about Tito, that he actually kind of homogenized the Balkans. But do you think that the the death of Tito um, actually caused the breakup of the Yugoslav Republic, yeah. or do you think it was more the breakup of the Soviet Union? No, I think that, uh, well, actually, after Tito dies, the nationalists then started to come into the surface, and this is how it started, and Actually, Milosevic uh, was the one who had very strong appetites. There might be Soviet unions. Unions are always present here in the Balkans. And uh, Serbia is always influenced uh, by them. They have extremely well-organized lobby. And uh, even today, uh, yesterday on TV, there were some news that were happening in the north of uh, uh, Kosovo, where this is uh, the Serbian part uh, community, and somehow Serbia wants still to to have their rule there, and uh, lots of activities are being uh, manipulated and organized and influenced by Serbia still. Mm, but to come back to your question, uh, yes, after Tito died, uh, uh, Milosevic. Uh, took uh, the advantage of this and as somehow they considered to inherit to be uh, to inherit uh, uh, the whole Yugoslav army this is how they started from Slovenia from Croatia and wanted somehow to take over the lead as Tito did but now in a completely different spirit in a national na- and chauvinistical way but uh, and then you know the story. Uh, they started from Slovenia, then to Croatia, and then Bosnia, because everybody, each of these republics, wanted to get their independent, 
independence and actually uh, somehow they were uh, uh, states on their own because each republic had uh, the elements of a state and Kosovo as well had the same uh, uh, elements of a state, but we were under still the administration of Serbia. Despite this, uh, more than 85% of population in Kosovo are Albanians and actually given the long uh, repressions and uh, discrimination that uh, it was done to, to, to our population, actually Albanians, Kosovo Albanians wanted to get the dependence. Milosevic uh, tried to undertake uh, steps before uh, we do, we proclaim the, the independence, he suspended even that autonomy that uh, we already had. And then since 1989, everything started to, to change, I mean, drastically, uh, until 1999. And then, you know, the story it started, uh, this uh, uh, conflict opened, let's say, conflict started, the big repression and massacre started uh, in the early 1997, 98, and then it reached... Uh, the very high level of repression in 1999 when actually NATO intervened. What are the challenges that you and the other leaders of the Kosovo Amateur Radio Association have going forward? Yeah, actually, uh, I would just uh, like, if you don't mind, to mention some other uh, amateur radios who are still active now from the former sure. uh, group, uh, that is uh, Zulu 6 uh, Two Fox Bravo, Zulu Six Two Fox Bravo. This is uh, Fehmi Boiniku, who is uh, an extremely good technician and amateur radio, and he is uh, a strong driving uh, driving force of uh, our amateur radio activities here even today. Then we have uh, Zulu Six One uh, uh, Delta X Ray. This is Driton. Then we have uh, Feti Fazliu, Zulu 61 Fox, uh, Fox, and uh, another one, Zulu 61 Alpha Sierra. These were my hands colleagues that we started actually together, our amateur radio history. And actually, I've uh, forgotten to, to mention an extremely high, good personality, former personality, who unfortunately died recently, just two months ago, who were really very active and was leading the youth hands uh, in the former Yugoslavia. This is uh, uh, Zulu 6 uh, 1 Alpha Bravo, Besimayeti. And he was actually the successor of uh, uh, the former uh, secretary to the uh, let's say, uh, amateur radio league uh, before before the war. And he was extremely uh, very skilled guy, very good ham, and he was on the top of lots of activities uh, at that time on radio. And then during the war, he went uh, uh, abroad uh, working for IOM, and he was doing an excellent uh, Things with IOM in different uh, countries, but unfortunately he died. So, so we are very sorry. But somehow, I felt uh, a need to 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 mention him in this uh, show. So let me ask again: what what are the greatest challenges that you and the other leaders of the amateur radio service in Kosovo? What are you facing right now as you're reconstituting amateur radio out of the ashes of the war? Yeah, there are many challenges. Uh, I, yesterday, uh, last time, I, I tried to make a kind of summary what happened uh, after, uh, after the adoption of the new regulations here. So we already have some uh, legal bylaws that uh, define the services of amateur radio here in Kosovo. But actually, we started from the scratch and uh, we are still facing lots of problems. Uh, we were supported by the Goodwill mission that was led, that is actually led by Marty Lane, 
we were, we had some support from IRU uh, Region 1 president in terms of providing guidelines on how to become members of uh, IRU because uh, although we tried to mobilize ourselves with some of the activities on the radio uh, with the support of course of the goodwill and some international hands but uh, with the uh, radio stations and activities but we were always considered pirates on the air because we were not rec yet, not yet recognized by IRU and DXCC uh, ARRL list. And uh, the challenges are because uh, there is no sign of uh, previous uh, inventories that we had, no premises. We have uh, one good premise. This is at the University of uh, Technical University where we actually had to refurbish the new room for the ham uh, radio activities. We don't have radio stations. We were donated few radio stations. Uh, we, the former veterans uh, of uh, as hams, uh, we were donated by several donors and by the Goodwill uh, uh, project. So this is uh, how we are working on today. So we still lack uh, lots of resources. We we have no sponsors. There's no uh, sustainable financial, let's say, support by institutions. As I said, uh, this is a new country. And as there was a huge gap uh, of uh, 25 years uh, between the two regimes, the new institutional structures has not yet considered amateur radio activities in there, let's say, has not yet embraced uh, amateur radio, uh, let's say, um, community in uh, their institutional, let's say, system. So we, we need to, when I say this, I, I mean, like earlier, amateur radio activities were very important in the emergency situation, in uh, natural disaster risks. And here, they're in the former system, and uh, as I see in other world, uh, uh, amateur radio is uh, very important in these cases. But here, we still need to build uh, this kind of connections. But uh, it is we are working on this. On the other hand, uh, yes, uh, we need uh, a kind of uh, new equipment, let's say uh, uh, transceivers, uh, antennas, PCs, uh, to make it more sustainable. We have few individuals, hams, who have been provided uh, with the radios, but uh, let's say we don't have a well-equipped uh, um, let's say, uh, premises where we could learn, then smoothly develop our activities. How many hams are operating right now in, um, in Kosovo? More than 100 uh, hams, uh, certified license. But now still, these young uh, hams, they don't have their own radios. They have to come to the radio club and, and work from, uh, I see. from the radio club while uh, uh, most of uh, the hands that have, has, have been uh, licensed from the university, these are students uh, that uh, somehow are moving from the university once they, they graduate. So uh, the, Pristina is a university center, and myself and our team has worked with the students who were uh, attending their studies at the university, but these are not residents of Pristina uh, students. So once they graduate, they move for their employment in their places or they move forward. So this is actually a moving uh, point. Does uh, Pristina have uh, uh, VHF or UHF repeaters? Yeah, actually we have HF uh, transceiver. And uh, we have uh, some, <clears throat> we are not yet very active in UHF and VHF because we still need to 
to to work on it. But uh, we as well, uh, our hams, uh, very skillful ones, have uh, started to prepare some repeaters uh, on individual basis. But we are thinking to build a more sustainable uh, uh, rank of the repeaters on VHF and UHF. And we will be working on this. But again, these are very expensive projects and we have to go step by step. Actually, we have bright ideas uh, to work with uh, technical schools as well to try to re-establish uh, actually uh, the former uh, way of how we did uh, when we started, because we consider as a more sustainable approach to develop more, let's say, active ham radio spirit uh, amongst the youngsters, uh, would be yes with students at the university, but uh, at the technical schools as well. So have fox hunts been revised or revived there in... Uh... Well, actually, not yet, because, uh, I mean, we have still some very old equipment. So we tried some activities in our one of our hills here in surroundings, and we we considered that might be a, a big attraction for for children because they like running in in uh, the nature and for them it, it looks like quite attractive and uh, actually here in the region there are some initiatives uh, to have some joint activities in this fox hunting do you think that Kosovo is a ham radio destination for hams from the West who might want to go there to operate, perhaps demonstrate, perhaps even leave equipment there. Do you think that that's a, a place that um, that one could go on vacation and really have a great time? Well, it depends on their expectations, but actually many today and recently there were several teams uh, that uh, came here and today our regulator is very busy with issuing uh, licenses for DX uh, expeditions here in Kosovo. And there were different groups of hams who were supporting our activities in the air, especially uh, recently when, after we became members of IRU Region 1 in 2015, and actually this year when we were we have been accepted uh, by ARRL, I mean, on the DXCC uh, list. And yes, I mean, uh, I mean, we don't have much uh, facilities, but uh, we can we can support uh, DX uh, expeditions and groups uh, to to come here and uh, try to do something. I mean, to support our activities and actually. Uh, some of the hams uh, that uh, were here from the international ones, yes, they are thinking of leaving their, some of the equipment, uh, antennas that uh, are needed. But this is uh, modest still at a modest level. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now, now that you're back in? Uh, this uh, friendship, their willingness, their readiness to accept us. They are so friendly in the band. And uh, when uh, uh, I was recently participating together with one of my students uh, uh, in this uh, 10th anniversary of uh, uh, Kosovo independence and acceptance event that was uh, organized here with a goodwill and a group of uh, international hams that were led by Marty Lane. And we were actually active for 30 days on air. And uh, when we jumped uh, on air, it was myself and uh, Donna Berisha, who has actually been donated a radio. Uh, actually, they were so excited, the community in the radio waiting. There were lots of piles there. Uh, waiting to, to make QSOs with us, not just with us, but with our other hams, uh, Zulu 6, 2 Fox, Bravo. Everybody is so keen to talk to us, uh, to embrace our community in this uh, 
big uh, ham international community. And this excites us a lot because we were rejected by uh, uh, our uh, neighbors here so much. We were uh, uh, somehow always accused as pirates on the radio. So we are illegal entity, why we shouldn't be left uh, working. Uh, uh, and uh, so for us, that was the, the most exciting thing. So we want becoming, we would love to, and the readiness and willingness of a larger radio amateur radio community to embrace Kosovo hams in their big family. Combined, right? With, we call that the we call that the maker movement <laughs> here in the West. Yeah, yeah, that is right. good. But yeah. we always have to bring the sport spirit combined with uh, uh, with sports activities. Oh, I I get it a hundred percent. Vajolsa, if if the listeners wanted to reach out to you, yes, um, how would they do that? Uh, I mean, either. Uh, it would be good. I can that, put your email address yes, in the uh, show notes. Yeah, please uh, do this because uh, although we have our radio shack there and I have my radios, but uh, as I'm quite a busy person, I have to work quite hard. Uh, I, I'm not always available uh, anytime, but by emails, uh, I can check them and we can schedule. Why not? We can communicate by emails. And... Uh, Sometimes I'm on the radio, but uh, it, de the, it depends on the propagation. It might not be because of the big distance uh, between Kosovo and USA. Uh, I, I, I fear that we, we can lose our momentum for the QSOs or contact. Well, we need to get a DMR repeater on top of the University of Pristina yeah, we, so that you can see, connect around yeah, the world. We will see how to handle this. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think that uh, we will work on that. Uh, what I just wanted to share with you is that I will, res I will be in, uh, uh, in April. I, I have been invited as a key guest to represent Kosovo at uh, the uh, uh, Visalia Convention. Uh, oh, really? In yes, California? Yeah, in California. I have the invitation and I will make a speech there. I'm an, a key a guest speaker there as a new DXCC uh, country member. So I will be there between, yeah, between 19 and uh, 23rd. So uh, I will be there together with um, with Marty, who actually uh, is finalizing in his 10 years mission here in Kosovo. Uh, he started his mission supporting uh, amateur radio activities in Kosovo since 2007. And now he's uh, finalizing, luckily successfully, his uh, support. And uh, by uh, uh, helping us, uh, actually guiding us on how to become members of IRU, lots of activities, lots of knowledge share. And uh, finally, we became DXCC member. And there will be as well uh, Jim, uh, who was uh, representing uh, IR IRRL here uh, during our activities. Uh, here in Kosovo, we were jointly operating from Kosovo. And now we will have a joint speech there at the main dinner uh, gala dinner there at the DX uh, convention in Visalia. So we were, we will be three speakers there, and w I will be one of them. Vajolsa, I I can't tell you how thrilled I am to actually have you on the QSO Today podcast. Um, this podcast will be longer, or is longer than probably um, many of the ones that I do. But I think that the history of uh, Kosovo and what happened there and the war and the rebirth of amateur radio is a story that um, the QSO Today listeners should hear. 
So with all of that, I just want to thank you so much for joining me and being a part of the QSO Today podcast. And I hope that at some point that, that I can actually come and do a de-expedition there and uh, see what's happening and see if there's some way that we can help. So with all of that, I want to thank you very much and wish you 73. Oh, thank you very much, Eric. I was extremely very excited to have this QSO with you today. And uh, please, I would like to send my best regards, greetings, and thanks to America for uh, helping us uh, becoming ind an independent country and uh, for embracing amateur radio society of Kosovo in their let's say, hearts, and uh, so we are very happy, and I'm passing as well. Best uh, wishes uh, on behalf of all amateur radio youngsters and my veterans from Kosovo. So warm regards to you, 73, and see you maybe in Visalia, America. Thank you very much, USA. Bye-bye. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Violsa. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in Z61VB in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and Soda Beams for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on the links on the show notes pages and mentioning when you purchase these fine products that you heard them here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of these episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support and makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available in iHeartRadio and the iTunes Store and now a host of podcast services and applications. I put the buttons on the right side of the show notes pages so you can listen to any way you want. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc. who is solely responsible for its content.